the topic of games and the future of culture. And I think um, none of these folks actually need an introduction, but I'm, I'm just going to do an introduction for everybody up front here. So Ian Bogust is a designer, philosopher, critic, and researcher who focuses on computational media, especially video games. He's also an author and an entrepreneur, a professor at Georgia Tech in Atlanta, a founding partner at Persuasive Games, the video game studio, and a board member of the educational publisher Open Texture. He's the co-editor with Nick Monford at MIT Press for the series on platform studies and author of four books about video games. And today we'll be pre presenting selections from a fifth book uh, forthcoming in September. And today what I hope we can talk about is really culture writ large because we've had um, art as culture in a, a variety of presentations beforehand. Um, we've seen several images from, from Renaissance Italy um, Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel and things like that. We've seen two uh, presentations that had uh, Edward Moybridge in, in it as well. Um, not that I have anything against Moybridge. There's a lovely show up at SF MoMA right now on his work. But it's been, it's been you know, that's, that's a kind of conservative notion of, of art and it's also a conservative notion of culture which includes both high and low culture. So. Um, I just thought maybe to, to start things, uh, thoughts off, I'd quote uh, Robin from her website where she says, games are often considered crude, different from other art forms, but in just over 40 years they've changed the way we think about computers, theater, television, and film. They redefine how we consume and produce entertainment. To expand their expressive capabilities, we must solve some non-trivial problems. So I thought um, Robin's word has a nice, nice way of getting us launched into a more expansive field of culture. So I'm going to hand over to Ian. All right. Uh, I'm, I'm honored to be here and especially thankful to the organizers for inviting me to participate in this, uh, this completely unreasonable panel on a topic that's way too big to talk about in any context, let alone in, in 15 minutes. So I was thinking about this, like games in the future of culture, which sounds, again, sort of totally unreasonable, and how I might, how I might address it. And they were, they were like, can you give us a title? What kind of, what kind of title you know, can, I, can I give? And I decided I would, um, I would talk a little bit about some work that um, I've been doing for a few years, but that's finally coming out in, in, in this book in September. Um, and, and, you know, possible titles for, for this talk, um, you know, I guess the, the, the way I would, I would title it for your purposes is, is like this, the, the domestication of video games. And I'll give you an alternative title because that's also an, an entertaining thing to do. Um, the Taco and the Stallion. <laughs> so uh, on the subject of, of games and culture, I, I guess what we're meant uh, to understand by this charge is sort of um, let's talk about about being successful and what we've already done to achieve that and what's what's left to do, which, which of course suggests the question, well, what would it mean? What, what, what are the criteria for, for success, for games playing a role in culture that we would, that we would celebrate, um, not just for having been influential, but for having been useful and, and good? And this got me reflecting on two ways in which I've partaken of, of games and culture um, together, neither of which has felt um, particularly successful, although uh, that, that lack of success has come in different forms. What, one of them is the whole serious games thing, which I've been really unfortunately connected to for, for many years now, despite um, having tried very hard to distance myself from it. I guess co-organizing the Serious Game Summit is not helping me in that regard. Um, but you know, the problem with this, this serious games uh, business is the, like the whole idea that there's, there's sort of like these, these games, and, and there, there's entertainment games, and then there's there's serious games, as if there's this thing called seriousness that exists out there in the world. And, and you know, when you think about, like, I don't know, magazines or any other kind of, of, of cultural form, you know, books, film, we don't really talk about serious magazines. Um, I mean, there's just a bunch of stuff, and you kind of have to make sense of it. So that was one problem I always had with serious games. And the other was that, 
So what, what serious games really seem to mean were sort of institutional games, games that were made for militaries and governments and corporations. And there's nothing intrinsically wrong with that, but that's a very particular way of, of, of framing that kind of work. And I've talked more about this in, in this book, so I won't go into it in further detail. But that, like, that didn't seem like a great way of addressing the role of games and culture, um, at least not solely. And the second um, community that I've been participating in is this uh, so-called art games community. And like this, this sort of idea that, you know, we're going we're gonna to take video games and we'll somehow like, you know, intersect them with art or raise them up um, to the level of art and then everything will be, will be really great. Um, and, you know, I, I really empathize with this, this sentiment that, you know, we want to take games and, and help them reach the level of acceptance and accomplishment of, of like, you know, writing or of, or of images or of, or of film. Um, this makes a lot of sense and I think that it's a worthwhile pursuit and we should want games to compete in culture in that way. Um, but it also seems incomplete as a, as a goal, as a, as a single goal. You know, just as um, words and images and, and film and marble and other kinds of materials can be put to use for art, there's also all sorts of other things that those media do in the world. I, I always like to look at um, airline safety as a sort of, uh, like airline safety is the opposite of art. Um, perhaps, and you know, you can you can you can write. Um, I, I love this is from a, a 1950s Pan Am Boeing Stratocruiser um, safety instruction. It, it helps you understand that you should keep your clothes on uh, in the event of a of a crash. But you know, here, here's words explaining airline safety and pictures explaining airline safety, and and you know, like um, you know, moving images um, explaining airline safety. So it, it's not really you know enough to point to one use and to say, well, this is how we judge the success of something. Because obviously, the only reason you can have that movie about uh, how to put on your seatbelt or use the, um, uh, the oxygen mask is because you understand something about how moving images work in the first place when you, when you get on the plane. So, so instead, um, I tried to think about what it would mean to consider games as a, as a medium. And then this is the angle through which I want to approach this question of games and culture. Um, and the ways that we talk about this, when we talk about it in the games industry or even in the research community sometimes, is, is one of two ways. One is by market size. Like, let's talk about the, the amount of money um, that the video game industry makes and whatever the number is. I mean, this is a, one, there's lots of ways of, of slicing and dicing these figures, and that's a way of looking at impact. Um, or by, by adoption, like especially the expansion of, of games uh, adoption. So like you could say, oh, 40% of women play games now and point to, you know, different figures historically. And, you know, these are interesting and sometimes uh, useful compass bearings, but they still don't seem um, uh, sufficient to me. And instead, I want to suggest that we, we look at the impact uh, and future of any medium, but games in particular, since that's our subject, as... Um, measured by its use, by its, by its diversity of use. And this is pretty easy to see anywhere. Like, um, you know, photography is, is a good example. Um, there are lots of ways that we use photography, and you know what a photograph is when you see it, and it doesn't have to be explained. So, you know, photography can be used for, for art to sort of record the experience of, of everyday life and to give us a sense of it in, in, a, in a different in a different setting or a different angle than we would normally see it. Um, it can be used to, as, as a, in a documentary way. Um, it can be used for surveillance or oversight. Um, it can be used to capture and store personal memories. This is not a photograph that is artistic, but it's nevertheless a photograph. And it, there's all sorts of other things. I mean, you can use photographs to kind of remind you which piece of PVC pipe you need to get at the store, uh, and you pull it up. I mean, you know, it's still a photograph, but it, these are very, very different uses of photography. And, you know, it's hard to characterize completely or sufficiently, but you can almost imagine that there's some kind of spectrum of use. And, you know, this is, again, insufficient. But, you know, if it runs from sort of art to tools or something like that, um, you know, then, then we can kind of look at photography or other mature media and say, you know, they, they explore that continuum from end to end. They've sort of evolved to the point where any possible use isn't surprising. And, and, you know, normally when we talk about video games, we, we might we kind of point to something like this and say, well, we haven't, we haven't found those uses. We're sort of only exploring entertainment. We're only exploring certain kinds of entertainment. Um, and, and that might be true, um, but the rhetoric that we usually follow that kind of observation with is that of, of futurity, of opportunity, that, you know, this is a defect in games, and there's this, this opportunity to go out and colonize new spaces and new forms. Um, but I've become sort of tired of thinking about games in terms of, their unmet potential and all the things that we have to do that we're not doing. 
I suspect that we've actually paid far too little attention to what games have already done. Um, and instead, um, I want to suggest that games have actually staked out quite a lot of territory on this spectrum. We just haven't been looking at them in that way. We haven't been looking for impact in that, in that way. Um, and you, we still have entertainment, you know, kind of true escapist entertainment as a, a popular use of games. And that, that, that ought to count uh, as one way of using games. And the kind of grammar that we get out of this sort of game has been repurposed and put to other uses. And these are some of the, you know, so-called serious games uses of games, like for, you know, military simulation or recruitment or public relations. And then they've sort of then readopted the uses of games themselves into, into other kinds of applications like therapy and phobia treatment. You know, presumably you wouldn't have to do this if you didn't use the games to then um, incite military training in the first place, but that's a topic for another talk. Um, or on the flip side, you know, using, uh, using the strategic aspects of games to try to explain strategies of nonviolent resistance. Um, this is a force more powerful, which was kind of a failure, but it was, it was, a, it was created with an attempt to deploy on the ground organizing um, uh, in politically charged um, despotic states. So this is kind of like leaflet propaganda, games as leaflet propaganda. And of course, you know, there's political campaign games and there's advertising games and promotional games and, you know, uses of games as educational tools, whether um, formal or informal. You know, there's, there's, um, there's this observation about Pokemon that I think Jim G makes that it requires uh, a reading level that's above the grade level of the average player of Pokemon. So, you know, when you, when your kid goes to school, they're asked to read at a lower level than Pokemon demands. Um, and, you know, there's like workplace training and, you know, all sorts of, of, um, uh, of examples, uh, in the kind of serious games domain. And, and when we think about, about art as, as kind of fitting into this, to this spectrum, sure, we can produce games that are kind of unabashedly or specifically meant to be artistic objects that, that, that want to exist in the context that art exists in. But, but if we do that, we also overlook the ways in which, um, traditional commercial games kind of function artistically. I mean, a, a game like Bully is just fantastic social satire. Um, and has a, a, a lot more commentary in it than many indie games happen to, which we might normally associate with that kind of artistic spectrum. Or um, games often get repurposed for relatively ordinary purposes, like kind of like drill, you know, like laparoscopic surgeons kind of like practicing their, their uh, um, you know, uh, finger movements by playing games or, or NASCAR drivers and, you know, pro, pro ball players uh, scoping out stadia or, or, um, or courses. You know, these are relatively mundane uses and kind of counterintuitive uses of products that were, were put out there for entertainment purposes. Um, other examples, I've been working on this, this problem of games and journalism for a few years, and there's lots of different ways that games can intersect with journalism, as it turns out, like, you know, editorial or kind of playable maps and documentary and um, uh, investigative reporting of sorts and kind of investigative systems. Um, Community organizing tools. Uh, we could we can think about the ways that games are themselves becoming sport or, or competition, um, or the ways that uh, games have become a, a popular way to experience music in, in a way that's actually quite similar to the emergence of, of something like the music video as a form that altered and expanded musical experience onto the TV. Um, and the kind of real time graphics that we've had in games now for many years also they make these things kind of just like places you you might want to go. There's a sort of virtual tourism at work in modern 3D games. And the best example of this, which I don't have time to show, is uh, Jim Munro made this this uh, machinima with Grand Theft Auto, um, where he, he was like the Canadian tourist wandering around Liberty City, just kind of enjoying the sunset. Um, and, and, you know, commercial games are also kind of places where we carry out social customs and rituals. And, and this is true on, on, on Facebook games or on... Uh, 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 the add-on packs that we see in, uh, in traditional games. And then there's like just games as kind of lifestyle product. These, these terrible um, uh, religious games are really not meant to be good games. So we can't really criticize them on those grounds. They're just meant to be sort of product, Christian products um, that you would buy like you would buy a, a motivational poster or something. Um, we have games as distributed work. We have games as exercise. We have games as meditation. Um, we have games that are sort of like uh, ritual acts. I mean, Bejeweled is probably a lot more, has a lot more in common with doodling or knitting than it does with StarCraft. And we have games that function as pornography or that try to function as pornography. We have games that function as hate speech. There's, there's all sorts of kind of purposes to which games are being put to use, some intentional and some uh, adapted from uh, different uses. 
Um, so Marshall McLuhan, the media theorist, um, describes the function of media in many ways, and one of them is through this concept of figure and ground. And in his understanding, the figure is the, the medium and the ground is like its context. And you have to understand these two together because they affect one another. And what happens is that the, the ground tends to kind of recede into the background. It's always there, uh, but we don't see it or think about it. We look past it and we focus on figures. And, and these, these kind of changes in media happen historically and, and in a kind of evolutionary way. So for example, the electric light, which in McLuhan's world counts as a medium because it extends our senses in different ways. It turns um, dark spaces, nighttime, into figure, what would otherwise have receded into the background, you wouldn't have been able to see anything, so maybe you would have listened instead. Um, now we can see, and so we don't think about the electric light anymore. It just recedes into the background, and we, we assume that we'll be able to do whatever we do um, anytime we want to, because we have uh, electric power by which to do so. And I think today we, we imagine that video games are the, the primary term, the, the figure in, in McLuhan's terms. And we're very proud of ourselves for, for working in figure rather than in ground. And you know, all of the purposes I've described uh, in very, very short form and many others that I've skipped are kind of vectors. We think of them as these sort of opportunities that intersect with video games. They're, they're options for us. There are places where we could expand our dominion, our market, our influence. But there's a, another way to see things, which is that, that games are just one of many media that can be deployed in different contexts. And this ought to be a, a somewhat humbling view to take. So I think one of the implications of the expansion of video games as a medium is the, uh, the eventual end of the kind of wild west. Uh, we, can, we can either remain outlaws and be obscure and sit at the edges of mainstream culture, or we can become naturalized. I mean, we can't really have it both ways. And if you think about um, some current trends in games, uh, which, which some of us have opinions about, like Facebook games or you know, gamification. And there, there's lots of anger and anxiety about what these trends do to games, whether they're violent attacks on, on, on games as a form. They're serving that purpose of expanding the use of the medium in general. And this is quite counterintuitive and, and really relatively startling to think about. Um, here's a, one way of framing it. This is uh, Soviet First Deputy Premier Anastas Mikoyan, a picture of him from the December 7th, 1959 issue of Life magazine. And he was visiting Mexico City and had been, uh, had been drinking tequila, um, which is, you know, I guess there was some surprising reactions that he had. And in this image, he's actually um, eating a taco as a kind of chaser for, for his tequila. And you read the, the, the caption for this image in Life magazine from 1959. It says, looking somewhat dazed, he downs a taco, which is meat wrapped in a tortilla. And this is just an amazing captioned to, to me that, you know, in 1959, the idea of the taco was so foreign that it had to be, you know, italicized and, and it had to be explained and we didn't know what it was. And there, there's something startling about that because, you know, what it means to, to kind of make something familiar is also to make it kind of ghastly and ordinary in, in some way. And, you know, the, the, the Taco Bell is not necessarily something we celebrate as, uh, as high food culture, but it's nevertheless uh, one way in which something like the taco becomes common. So we tend to talk about the success of media in general as a kind of increase in appeal or accessibility or even as a kind of democratization that everyone can get access to it and they know how to use it and there's a literacy uh, around it. Uh, but media like uh, games aren't really democratized. They're, they're kind of tamed instead or domesticated. And domestication is violent. And it's, it's kind of tragic, too. It, it strips the stallion of its power and its magic and its beauty, but it also allows one to put it to more general use. And I think you know, some species of, of video game will remain wild, um, you know, like the kudzu, but they're kind of destined to be uh, exceptions rather than, rather than the rule. So I guess my perspective on the future of games and culture is that we ought to plant flowers everywhere. And, and when, we, when we do that, we don't necessarily have to like all of the uses that we see, but rather that uh, the, more, the more purposes and practices that can involve games, um, then the more familiar this medium becomes. So, so we don't expand games and culture by drawing more people into our secret club, but by expanding the, the purview of our influence. 
And th again, there's something dramatically humbling about this realization. And like it or not, what we really do when we work to advance video games is to make them more ordinary and more familiar, more obvious even. And sometimes that will mean they'll be forgettable, but other times it will mean they'll be remarkable. And that's the, the future of games and culture to me. Thanks.